Design build has become a widely used construction project delivery method due primarily to the ability that it has to complete projects quickly and efficiently while also reducing costs. And in this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, we'll be talking with John Wallace, PE, SE, DGE, Fellow and American Society of Civil Engineers. He's a senior advisor at Keller North America Incorporated. And we'll be talking about his thoughts regarding geotechnical project deliveries that use design build, and also a little bit more about managing risk within design build. We'll also talk about career advancement as a geotechnical engineer, and also the importance of giving back through professional societies. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. But before we get into our episode for today, Here's a quick word from today's sponsor, that being Keller. Welcome to the show, John. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you today, Jared? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad that you could be on the show with us. We've been looking forward to this conversation and thank you for being here. Really, really appreciate you. You're being welcome. Here. I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Awesome. It'll be great if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself. And again, what is it that you do on a daily basis at Keller? So I've been with Hayward Baker and Keller. You know, we changed our name in 2020, even though, uh, Keller bought Hayward Baker in 1984. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they've, they've been around for a long time with us and, and we obviously know them very well, but so I've been with that group for 26 years. And as you can imagine during that time, you know, you go through different jobs. And so I've been design engineer, uh, branch manager, uh, marketing guy, uh, chief geotechnical engineer, uh, vice president. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's changed obviously through the years based on the needs of the business. And then four and a half years ago, I actually partially retired. So uh, I've been working about half time for the last four and a half years. And, uh, you know, basically I'm in a support role. Uh, my specialties are what we call structural support um, and earth retention. And, uh, my favorites are micro piles and soil nailing earth retention, uh, stone column and vibro pier foundations. Those are my favorites. And, uh, I help all the branches of Keller mainly in the U S occasionally internationally, uh, with problems or solutions or bidding, uh, design also for those topics. And so I basically answer the phone and, uh, and take part in, you know, various, uh, dis uh, meetings and calls we have during the week. Wow. That's a lot. So I, I, I almost want to ask why well, I will ask what, what positions didn't you take? It sounds like you did everything within the organization, <laughs> right? <It's> <laughs> yeah. A little bit a dr everything. driller. Uh, I, mean, I was never very good at drilling, but uh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, you know, when you're around that long and you know, it's a dynamic organization, you get asked to do different things. And as we grew, uh, we've grown quite a bit since I joined the company. Uh, you know, those were the, the things that I was asked to do and uh, more than happy to do. So it's, it's been, it's been quite a ride to be honest with you. It's been a lot of fun. That's great. That's great. And how is retirement? I, I hear about this, this thing they call retirement. And most people I talk to, 
that are retired talk about how they're working. So how, how is that? How does that work? Out? Yeah, it's uh, well, thank goodness. Uh, I didn't retire for, Fully four and a half years ago because COVID hit shortly thereafter. And I think I would have lost my mind uh, <laughs> during COVID because, you know, it really limited what you could do, where you could go, et cetera. So it was great because I was able to work from home, you know, primarily via computer and cell phone and, and still uh, contribute. So uh it's great. Uh, I work, like I said, about half time. Uh, I have hobbies. I've taken up woodworking since I retired, and especially during the COVID period. You know, I've been building shelves and cabinets and display stands and that kind of thing. And it was something that I dabbled in my whole life. But you know, I had more time to work on it and do some pretty cool stuff uh, since then. But uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great. It's, it, I, you know, try to spend some time with the grandkids. Uh, I have a, a mountain home that I go up to and uh, relax uh, sometimes on the weekends, et cetera. And so uh, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. And, you know, work-life balance or work-life integration, uh, life-work balance, life-work integration, or just well-being and wellness are things that Folks are talking about a lot now and curious to hear what your thoughts are for, again, let's say before retirement, how were you able to accomplish balance with all that you had you're responsible for? Yeah, uh, I wasn't really the best at that okay. for the first couple decades. Uh, I worked <laughs> okay. a lot um, and not only did I work, but I traveled. Uh, I, I, I haven't, I, I'm sure I'm not the biggest traveler in our business. You know, there's a lot of people that travel, but, you know, unfortunately for about over 30 years, I was gone about 200 weekdays wow. and, uh, you know, Delta, Delta airlines loved me. And, uh, so did, uh, Marriott and, <laughs> and, uh, Avis rent cars, okay. but, uh, it, 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 uh, it really dawned on me, you know, my wife really raised our kids uh i was home 98 percent of the weekend so that was good but oftentimes i was kind of you know i'd fly in friday night and fly out sunday night or monday morning a lot of times so uh i i discovered that uh doing something like coaching you know i coached baseball for a couple of decades uh initially with my son uh for 15 years or so and uh you know, I, it enabled me to have an excuse to, uh, to get home and, and uh, do baseball on the weekends. I didn't do it as much during the week. They, they often had a game during the week, too. So uh, coaching uh, youth sports is a really good thing, I think, for a work-life balance. It, it gives you something way different than, you know, what you got going on at work, and, and I really like that. And then uh, – the other other thing that I've done through the years, and you know, a lot of my friends know about this, is I've I've been interested in classic cars. So uh, now that I'm retired, I've I've bought a couple of other ones. So I've got four classic cars right now: uh, two from the '50s, one from the '60s, and one from the '70s. And I spend a lot of time with the car club. I'm the secretary secretary treasurer of our car local car club, and uh, uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy being and meeting uh, and seeing other cars with people that have similar interests. So those those are a couple of the things that I do along with woodworking. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I appreciate your honesty there. And and the reality is that we, we make the best of the time that we have when we're around our family. And uh, it sounds yeah. like you found a way that you found a way to make it work. Right. So that's that's great. That's great. And I think that the, I probably, you know, I probably wasn't the best. I wasn't what? the best at it, but all uh, good though. All good. You, that's why you got the grandkids, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Just pour into them. And I, I, I love that you're, you're doing things that are completely different from like geotech, right? You're talking about the, the classic that's right. cars. So I think that the creativity that you're experiencing there, it, it comes back to when you're doing your consulting and, and, and going after projects. That's really, that's really awesome. Really awesome. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Oh, no problem. No problem. And let's talk about design build just a, just a tad for our listeners that might not be too familiar with design build. Can you explain a little bit about what that entails? Yeah. So let me, let me give a little background about that, that I think people might find interesting and they may not realize as much, but uh, you know, design build 
is fairly new, you know, a few decades here in the U.S., but it was done in Europe a long time before that. And, uh, you know, when I met folks, uh, mainly Europeans, even when I was in college, I, did, I found out, and going back to that, I was in college in the 70s. So uh, if you were a civil or, you know, and a geotechnical engineer back in the 70s and you were in Europe, most of those engineers work for contractors yeah. because the design build uh, method of con of contracting and project delivery de deliverance was very popular in Europe. Okay. And actually my first job was with a company called law engineering. And then we had a joint venture company with a, an Austrian company called GeoConsult. And GeoConsult was a an Austrian consulting company, but when I met those guys, they're like, we're different. You know, most of the guys we work with, they work for tunneling contractors, they work for general contractors, specialty contractors. And so it kind of came over from Europe, and it's a method where the contractor employs the design engineers and provides both design and construction and so in the u.s for you know long time it was design bid build okay where a consulting engineer say you know a structural and or geotechnical engineer would come up with a design they put they put the plans together they put it out for bids contractors would bid on it and the owner would pick typically the you know the most qualified or lowest bid whatever so in europe you put out a, uh, a request for proposals that the, the owner said, and he may have had an engineer that consulted with him, but he wasn't doing the design for the project. It would say what the owner really wanted, what their scope of work was, and the contractor would provide both the design and the construction. And so uh, I always liked that idea. Um, I found it to be a lot of fun. I, I, you know, I switched from consulting engineering to contracting pretty early in my career after about eight years. And I've always worked for a design build contractor since then. So, uh, you know, it's basically the, the, the contractor provides both the design and construction for a project. Excellent. Excellent. And what would you say are the advantages and the disadvantages for say design build, uh, project delivery method? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've thought about that and I can't really think of any disadvantages <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, other, other than the, the contractor has to have in place a system that's foolproof or, you know, fail safe, I guess I should say, uh, for checking his design. And they can't let dollars be the only uh, governance for what they provide. You know, you have to have uh, good, checkable and buildable designs. And so... Uh, you know, that I guess that's maybe one downfall is that, you know, you could let the dollar signs get in the way of your good engineering judgment. But if you're a good engineer and, uh, you know, you follow your your credos, your PE codes, et cetera, you know, you, you can't let that happen. So uh, it, it really is a uh, great method and a lot of innovation, you know, through the years has come from the design build method because you're so close with the actual uh builders you know the the guys who are out in the field and they have a lot of good ideas and they'll tell you if something doesn't work you know so i've always i've always said when people have asked me you know what about design build versus uh design bid build one of the things i tell them is well you know if you're a if you're a design engineer and you come up with a set of plans and you tell us to do something that we don't have the equipment for then we have to go buy that equipment in order to do it. Yeah. And you're going to, and your owner is going to pay for that, you know? So if, if you're working for the contractor, you design with the equipment you already have, because yeah. you want to be, you know, offer a more cost efficient uh, solution. So, you know, that's just a, a one example, but uh, there aren't a lot of uh, uh, bad things that I can think of about design builders, a heck of a lot of good things. So I'm, I'm a big proponent. Okay, great, great. Well, what are what are some of the strategies? Because you know, one of the things that that um, you know, as an engineering consultant, one of the things I hear people talk about when we think design build is we think about risk. 
So, you know, what are some of the strategies to manage risk for a design build project? Yes. And so, uh, you know, you can't just jump into design build and say, you know, I'm going to hire an engineer and, you know, uh, I know this guy's a good guy and he's going to design this stuff for us and he's going to do what I tell him or whatever, yeah. you know, if you're the only, <laughs> that, that doesn't work. So you really need a plan and a, uh, uh, a structure if you're going to do design build that incorporates a lot of checks and balances. Uh, you know, you have to make sure the design is properly checked by a qualified, you know, uh, reg registered professional engineers. And uh, then when you get out there in the field, you need to make sure that you have the proper quality control, quality insurance, assurance. And that's, that's something that I do see that is lacking in a lot of uh, design build work. Uh, we have a whole department at, uh, at Keller that we go out and, and we have uh, qualified engineers, you know, record and watch what we're doing. And if we uh, are doing something that's not on the plans or the way it should be done, you know, we have a, a check and balance system that we put, uh, that's put in place. And it's very powerful that, Hey, you know, you got to stop and you got to do exactly what's shown here on the plans that the uh, PE stamp. So a lot of people don't have that. I, I don't think, or, or they don't, a follow through it's expensive you know you have to have uh, hire people that are good at that type of thing and experienced and they also have to be have the right personality to uh to uh, interject into the project and you know these things could affect schedule and and that type of thing and cost but hey you know it's got to be done the way yeah. <laughs> it was uh, designed so you know, th th those are a couple of things, checks and balances, basically, and uh, quality control and quality assurance. Okay, makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. And I thought, you know, we were, you know, trying to get you for the show, I was saying, you know, where, where did I first meet John? And I was going back and I said it was the professional organizations, you know? So I'm curious, yeah. to, you know, your, your involvement in professional organizations, how did that help you grow personally and, and professionally? Yeah, so I almost got in, started getting involved in the local ASCE by mistake because <laughs> uh, uh, it, had, it had been around. This is the Georgia ASCE. It had been around for decades. It, you know, uh, George Sowers uh, was a famous geotechnical engineer here in Atlanta, and he had started it, I think, you know, back in the 50s, and, and they'd met for decades. And I finally I got a call one day. I hadn't really i've gone to some of the meetings you know i'd go to their uh uh monthly meetings occasionally but i i hadn't really gotten involved because i was pretty busy and out of town a lot but i got a call and they invited me to join the committee and the only reason they invited me was they wanted a contractor <laughs> you know they were all uh consulting engineers on the board and they they thought that it would be good to throw in a contractor to have uh, you know a different opinion so uh, since I was in that line of work, they, they got me involved. So I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I was on the committee for years. I finally got elected uh, chair of the committee uh, after maybe a decade or something. And then uh, I, uh, I also was very interested in like ADSC and the DFI in particular. I really like the way the DFI has a blend of consultants, contractors, suppliers, owners, and uh, a, a, it's a real good perspective. So I, I learned quickly when I was with on the uh, ASCE Georgia, which later became the Geo Institute of Georgia, that it was good for my career. Um, you know, I was working and meeting owners, engineers, other competitors but you know you, you just get to know them as people instead of uh you know somebody that you you automatically disliked or whatever and uh, you know they're just regular guys or and girls like the rest of us but uh uh it was great for business you know uh, you got all these different opinions and ideas and then if somebody had a problem or a project, you know, they would call you up because your name, you know, was fresh in their mind because they'd seen you at a meeting or something. So, and then, you know, in the DFI, I, I got involved initially. I was a uh, on committees for micropiles and earth retention. 
I became chair of the microfile committee um, and uh, and eventually was on the, you know, the board of trustees. And then I was the president from uh, two th late 2014 through 2016. That was just a great experience. I mean, uh, it's one of the things I really cherished in my career was the presidency of DFI. It was it's a great organization, great people. And uh, the whole thing was just fantastic. You know, we we were incorporating DFI India. We were starting new committees. We did the carbon calculator when I was president. Yeah. You know, we funded that. And uh, uh, there was just a lot going on at that particular time. And, and it, I really cherish it. And I think it had a lot to do with the success of my career because I got a lot of business from people who called, who knew me through DFI and ASCE. And uh, it was just great. Oh, it has awesome. been great. Yeah. <laughs> all around wins, all around wins. You, you can't go that's wrong right. when you're giving back. So so thank you for your leadership. That's really great. No, you, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, before we take our break, final piece of advice you'd like to give the geotechnical engineers that are listening in or watching. Um. So I have a little bit of a pet peeve about geotechnical engineering, and, and that's that uh, I meet a lot of geotechnical engineers. A lot of them, you know, have advanced degrees who don't know much about geology. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, I went I went to Illinois, as you did. Yeah. And we were pretty keen on geology at Illinois. You know, I took every geology course I could lay my hands on, including, you know, like eight hours of engineering geology in grad school uh, taught by uh, Alberto Nieto, who was uh, Don Deere's protege. And uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. But, but you have to know your geology. Uh, it, it's amazing to me how many geotechnical engineers don't know that much about geology. And it's the cornerstone of, of everything I do in geotechnical engineering. You know, if people tell me they have a project at a certain location, that ge geologic setting pops up in my mind. And, you know, I think about what the bedrock's like, what the soils are like. And, uh, and I know just from where they're, it's located, particularly in the United States, you know, what, what I'm looking at to begin with. So nothing drives me crazier. <laughs> I actually had an engineer one time tell me that he was drilling in georgia in in uh, north georgia and he was hitting shale and i said to him it wasn't shale and he looked at me like i was crazy he says how do you know that and i said there is no shale in in you know that area of georgia yeah. and he goes well it sure looked like shale <laughs> and i said well it may have but i'm telling Damn, you right now it, it might have been schist <laughs> Yeah, you know, it might have been a schistose material or schist, yeah. and I and I've had other engineers in Tennessee tell me they were in granite, and there's no <laughs> granite in uh, in Tennessee. So, it just it's a pet peeve of mine. And and if you if you can, I mean, buy a buy a geology buy a book, book I right? Mean, <laughs> yeah, buy a book and read it. My geology book uh, from undergrad reads like a novel. You know, it was like way back when. You know. Yeah. <laughs> in time you know, millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth or whatever but and it's just a great read i can sit down and read through the whole thing or you know audit a course you know there's so many courses online now uh you know do something along those lines and then i have one other since okay. i'm not a consulting engineer i have one other advice uh, having been a consultant for eight years and billing by the hour and, and having a, a daughter who's also an attorney that bills by the hour. I don't know how the world ever started billing by the hour, but boy, what a bad idea. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, I spent time filling out my timesheet than I would do in work half the time. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, all these codes and all this kind of stuff. So yeah. <laughs> I, I learned this. I learned this from uh, Dr. Jim Withiam decades ago from da at Dapolonia, who's the editor of Geostrata magazine. Mm -hmm. Bill by project percent complete. Oh wow! There you go. <laughs> Ask your client if that's okay, and you know what they're going to say? They're like, I don't care. Sure, you know yeah. it. They know when the job's half done or three quarters done or full done. Mm -hmm. And if you're good and you work you know your tail off and you get it done early you're going to make more money you know uh than billing by the hour but i hate bills by the hour and i hate timesheets 
And uh, I've said this many times through the years. And uh, I think I think it, it would be a great idea for the consulting industry to just forget about those hourly bills. It's 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 too tedious. It is indeed a pain. It is indeed yeah. a pain. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I started, I was like, wait, I got to do this forever? It's like, yeah, in consulting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, but I appreciate it's worse if you're a lawyer. Oh, my, yeah, my daughter, like... I think, bills every 10 minutes. You oh, know? Uh, my goodness. Yeah. She has to keep track of her time every 10 minutes. It's, I mean, she's got a high billing rate. So, you know, it's yeah. still a lot of money, but golly, no thanks. <laughs> that is a pain. So the construction world, the, the contracting world, it's like, yeah, we don't have to worry about that, right? It's like, we, we don't do that. We, I mean, I, I've never filled out a timesheet wow. since I've been a contractor. I've never filled out a timesheet. I'm sure somebody fills one out to get me paid every week, you know, yeah. where they put in 88888 or whatever. But, uh, you know. That is funny. That is funny. Well, thank yeah. you so much. We're going we're gonna to take a pause right here. We're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out with John on our Career Factor Safety End segment. Stick around. All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with John Wallace, PE, SE, DGE, FASCE, who is the senior advisor of Keller North America. John, you've had a very successful career. And when you look back on your career, what's one thing you implemented in your career to give yourself what's called a factor of safety in your career? So Jared, I, uh, I like to think of my work uh, life as a team, you know, where I have uh, uh, different folks that I work with. Uh, you know, Keller's a large organization. We've got a lot of employees, a lot of really smart people in a, in a lot of different areas. So uh, it's my team. And and some, some, a lot of folks are outside of Keller, you know, they're consultants or, uh, you know, ex-colleagues, that type of thing. And so, you know, I, I, you can't know everything. You try to know as much as you can, but if something comes up that I really need advice on, I just call one of my, you know, good friends who are specialists or, or I don't like the word experts, but specialists in certain techniques like, uh, you know, for grouting, complex grouting projects, especially for dams uh, and building foundations. Uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Donald Bruce at Nicholson for 10 years. Uh, Donald and I are great friends. Uh, you know, he, he will, he answers the phone and, uh, and my questions, he's, he's, he's great for grouting questions and, and a lot of other questions too. Uh, you know, other, spe other specialties, uh, like expansive soils, we have a, a, a Art Pengelly in our uh, Texas office, Northern Texas office. Uh, is uh, he knows all the chemistry and and how to design and build that type of fix. Um, uh, Vibral pier stone columns. You know, we've got uh, Dr. Al Sane at our corporate office and and Dr. Tanner Blackburn. Uh, you know, they're they're great resources, but. You know, my factor of safety has just been to lean on my team, and uh, I, I have a I have a fun saying that I've used uh, for many years, and that is uh, Confucius says that a smart man knows everything, but a wise man knows everybody. And uh, one of the things I've tried to do in my life is is meet a lot of people and and you know bring them into my circle of friends and my professional circle, and and you know they call me too, you know if they've got something you know, dealing with micropiles or earth retention or, you know, grouting as well. So that, that's my factor of safety is my team. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing all these great insights. You've shared some great information. I know it's going to be helpful for the folks who are listening in and watching. If somebody wanted to reach out to you, how can they find you? You have an email you want to share or are you on social media? Um, you know, I'm not particularly on social media. Okay. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel that has, uh, some, you know, they do the field trip, uh, uh, videos that, uh, uh, Brad Keeler does, et cetera. And I'm getting ready to upload a new one of those. They're, they're fun and they're okay. uh, funny, a lot of them, but 
You know, it's J.R. Wallacek at Keller-NA.com. So, okay. Keller-NorthAmerica.com. So, uh, yeah, I, I answer my phone. I answer my email. So, that's another uh, good thing to do in your career is uh, not to have somebody call your phone and have the voicemail full or uh, not respond to an email for a week. So, I'm, I'm pretty good about doing those things, especially since I'm semi-retired. There you I've go. got the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. We'll make All sure right. to get the... Uh... The, the website for the uh, we'll get the YouTube channel on the uh, on the show notes as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> Sounds good. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 68, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors.